Hey Cool Worlds, it's David. So today we need to talk about semantics, a topic which on the one hand seems of little scientific interest, but on the other hand seems to invoke an inordinate amount of discussion and emotion. Case in point, just take the planetary hood nature of Pluto for reference. But forget Pluto, because today I want to talk about the phrase Earth-like, a phrase which you have almost certainly encountered in scientific articles and videos like this one, and also maybe even in press releases and scientific papers by scientists themselves. But before I go any further, I actually want you to pause the video at this point and ask yourself a single question. What do you imagine in your mind when you hear the phrase Earth-like planet? Because as it turns out, that's kind of a key point in the argument which is gonna follow. Okay, so back with me. So there appears to be an emerging consensus amongst astronomers at the moment that really we should never use the phrase Earth-like under any circumstances at the present time. The basic argument is that we do not yet have the ability to assess whether a planet is truly Earth-like, particularly in reference to surface conditions. And so using that phrase is an act of deliberate sensationalism because it stirs up images of beaches awash with life in the public's mind. Instead, we should stick to phrases like Earth-sized, things we can actually measure with current observational measurements. There's a popular view amongst astronomers that using this phrase somehow cheapens it at this point in time. And thus when we eventually do find, you know, a truly Earth-like planet, whatever that really means, then, you know, the public will be fatigued at that point. They would have seen so many headlines already about Earth-like planets that they'll be like, you know, what's the big deal about this one? In other words, there's a concern which links directly to funding here, that the public will mistakenly take the view that we have already found Earth-like planets and thus further research on this area is no longer necessary. That is a strong argument, packed with very real and genuine concerns. It is sculpted by more than a decade of science articles miscommunicating and sensationalizing our work. Many exoplanetaries are carrying the scars of these public communication blunders, operating in an ever tighter fiscal environment, and are frustrated with the charlatans who race to glory on the back of what really amounts to spin. I get it, I totally hear you and I understand where you're coming from. So whilst that appears to be the consensus amongst many astronomers, I'm gonna stick my neck out today and present a counter argument to this line of thought. Really, I just wanna promote a discussion about this issue and I think we need some balance in the debate. We need a voice on the other side, so I'm hoping we can kind of swing the pendulum a little bit back to the middle and have an open dialogue today. So full disclosure here that the argument I'm about to present to you is counter mainstream and since there's no such thing as an unbiased objective person, Person, then you know treat the view I'm about to present to you as exactly that the opinion of a biased human being My hope is that actually you guys will weigh in on this and be the judge on this matter because ultimately it is the issue of public perception Which is completely driving this debate So let's just ask the question whether the phrase earth-like is correct or not in a purely scientific and grammatical context. Let's just forget the public perception for the moment. According to Wiktionary and other dictionaries, the suffix like simply means having some characteristics of. The definition is not that it shares all of the characteristics, just some. Indeed, if it shared all of the characteristics, then it would be an Earth twin or an Earth clone. And I completely agree that that phrase is not legitimate to use. I mean, we don't have the sufficient ability to do detailed assessment to say whether a planet is an Earth twin or not. But the suffix like is far softer and merely requires that some properties be similar. On that basis alone, the phrase could be used in the present era of characterization abilities and it could be used in a context which was technically correct. Now I have heard a rebuttal to this line of thought which says that you know even though Earth-like is technically correct, it's superfluous because in practice, the only thing we can measure is the size of extrasolar planets, and thus it's far more appropriate just to call them Earth-sized rather than making that leap and calling them Earth-like. In a nutshell, I would disagree with that because we can reliably, today, measure several other useful properties about planets, such as their mass, eccentricity, insulation, host star type, and all of those properties are legitimate axes against which to frame the similarity between planets. Radius and mass, for example, are definitively not degenerate with each other. Just because a planet has the same mass as the Earth doesn't necessarily mean that it will have the same radius as the Earth. Planets, like people, come in very diverse flavors. A case in point is a planet I discovered called KY314c, whose mass is almost exactly that of the Earth, 
but whose radius is 60% larger, meaning that it is most likely a mini Neptune and not a solid planet like the Earth. So that planet is decidedly not Earth-like, but if we measured its radius to be one Earth radii, then it would be legitimate, at least in my opinion, to describe that planet's bulk properties as being Earth-like. Overall, there are numerous characteristics of planets we can currently measure, and thus the phrase Earth-like is technically sound, because that merely demands that multiple properties be similar. A basic problem with outlawing the phrase Earth-like because we can't inspect surface conditions right now is that that same argument can be invoked against us later on down the road in say 10, 20, 30 years. So let's say we find a planet with similar surface temperature and atmospheric pressure, a group of astronomers could band together and claim that, you know what, you can't call this planet Earth-like because you don't know if the topographical relief is the same as the Earth, or the ocean to land fraction is the same as the Earth, or the continents are distributed in the same way as that of the Earth. All of which could be legitimately used to say that that planet is not truly Earth-like. So we end up with this rabbit hole where no planet will ever satisfy the criteria to be called Earth-like, because that in itself is a moving goalpost much like Zeno's arrow, forever out of our current reach. And furthermore, who gets to decide the list of criteria which ultimately define what an Earth-like planet really is versus something less, whatever that may be? Well, the problem is that nobody can claim they legitimately have the authority to define that list, because the suffix like, at a grammatical level, does not require that specific characteristics are similar merely that some characteristics are similar. To convince yourself that there is nothing technically wrong with using the suffix like in this context, remember that the astronomical community regularly uses the phrases sun-like star or Jupiter-like planet, and there's no outrage about their use. I've never seen anybody stand up at a conference and say, you know, just because that star has the same mass and radius as that as the sun, you are forbidden from using the phrase sun-like star because you don't know yet if the interior of that star is exactly the same as the sun, and that just doesn't happen. Okay, so that's the technical counter-argument to this, but to be fair, the popular objection to the phrase Earth-like is actually not so much focused on grammatical correctness, so much as the public's perception of that phrase. As I said, the red flag is that astronomers argue that when the public hear the phrase Earth-like, they dream of planets teeming with life. So let's talk about perception, and to this I want to share with you two thoughts. The first is that I kind of think we need to give the public a bit more credit than we are right now. We're kind of treating them like children here, because we're censoring ourselves from using technically correct language for fear that some fraction of the public might conjure up a picture in their head which has been extrapolated too far. By consciously avoiding technically sound language, we are engaging in a deliberate act of crafting public messages to induce specific thoughts in the public's mind. An act which could arguably be classified as spin. The very thing this movement originally sought to avoid. My preference would be for an open and honest dialogue with the public, just like we have here on Cool Worlds, where we use the technically correct language, but we provide commentary and context to how to interpret what we have really found. A very valid rebuttal to this point would be that it's all very nice and well to have this commentary on a channel like this, but realistically, in the era of soundbites and Twitter headlines, most journalists will just boil all that commentary down to the single boilerplate expression, Earth-like. I totally get that, and I hear that argument, and I, you know what, I have mixed feelings about this too. I'm not completely locked in on this perspective. But I think, as a scientist, I have this hard-wired, gut-wrenching back reaction to the idea that I should avoid using technically sound language for the purposes of what really could be arguably classified as spin. Our job really shouldn't be to try and spin the scientific discoveries that we're making, but you know, maybe I'm just being really naive here, and it has become an unavoidable element to our work these days. The last thought I want to share with you on this issue of perception actually connects to the scientific method itself. The theory of gravity, for example, is just that, a theory. If somebody comes along tomorrow and demonstrates that it doesn't work anymore, then scientists would be compelled to abandon the theory and come up with some new model to explain the existing observations. Science is intrinsically evolutionary, adaptive, and ever-changing. Gravity can be a theory today, but can be in the scrap heap tomorrow. But that's what makes science so powerful, because we don't dig our heels in and say there exists these fixed, immutable, dogmatic truths to the universe. Everything is on the table all the time. In that vein, despite the fact we aren't able to conduct all of the possible experiments to test whether a planet is truly Earth-like or not, 
If all of the present data currently suggests it is compatible with an Earth-like planet, then that is a legitimate phrase to use in a scientific context. If new data comes out tomorrow that shows that this planet is decidedly not Earth-like anymore, then that's fine. Science works like that. We can update our naming and our model to reflect the new information in hand. That act really describes the scientific process and we shouldn't shy away from it. It is what makes the scientific process so powerful. So thanks for watching to this point. Those are some of my counter arguments to this anti-Earth-like movement. But as you can probably tell, you know, my opinion is not fixed and immutable either. Like, I'm still kind of having an evolving opinion about this issue too. I genuinely want to hear your thoughts and views on this issue, especially if you disagree with me on this, or if you have an orthogonal view which isn't well represented by either of the two sides I've discussed so far. Ultimately, the very act of having an open dialogue about this issue will solve it. If everybody is aware of all the caveats about the language we're using to describe these planets, then there'd be no need for a whole debate anymore about this. Another possible solution to this I like was put forward by Elizabeth Tasker, who pointed out that you know we wouldn't have this issue if there existed a blank template set of planets to which we could compare to. You know, maybe something like the M-class or Y-class planets that Star Trek uses. This is because whilst Earth-like and Venus-like are both apt descriptors of current exoplanet information we're finding, they clearly invoke very different images in one's mind, whereas, you know, an X-like planet, you know, wouldn't do that. But, you know, let me know what you think. Do you have a, maybe a better solution in mind aside from the Star Trek scheme? So thank you so much for watching, everybody. I really hope this is an issue that we can engage on together. Remember that my opinion isn't gospel. I really want to hear your views, and let's be willing to adapt our viewpoints to accommodate new insights others may have. After all, that is what makes the scientific process so powerful. So until the next video, stay thoughtful and stay curious.